welcome back and we're moving into our second conversation for today as we discuss the economic cost of discrimination. We're joined at this time by Phil Crean, who is the Director of Global Programs for the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, and Kayla Borosco, who is the Executive Director of UNIBAM, United Belize Advocacy Movement. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having us. So let's start off by finding out more about your organization as before we head into the meat of the matter. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> as of November, we became the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce. So that is NGLCC for short. Mm -hmm. And within the United States, we're the voice of the LGBT biz business community. And what does that really mean? It means that we promote economic empowerment as well as job opportunities for LGBT business owners. Mm -hmm. So we first certify that they are in fact, that a business is in fact owned by an LGBT person. After that, we then work to connect them to business opportunities. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> within, uh, through this process called supplier diversity, which is working really well in the United States, and it's when a corporate decides to specifically work with a marginalized group mm -hmm. throughout the supply chain. So we have around 189 corporate partners. We have over 1,000 certified LGBT businesses. And we have partnerships with about 60 state and local LGBT chambers of commerce. Mm -hmm. Phil, explain to me why the move to separate as a chamber of commerce specifically for LGBT businesses were ne was necessary. Yeah, sure. I mean, so it all comes down to, I think, inclusion within economic growth, yeah. right? So of course there is a lot of economic growth within the United States, but what we also found at the same time is that there's discrimination against marginalized groups and entrepreneurs throughout that process. And what we really represent is a way to, br to showcase the specific challenges that LGBT business owners have, and then find specific entry points with corporates who show that they have a true interest to work with LGBT business owners throughout the supply chain. And then we connect right there. Yeah. So it, it comes about through this dual idea that you need to promote inclusion within economic growth in general, and then specifically work with marginalized groups um, to add specific components there. I think this is most epitomized in NGLCC Global, which mm -hmm. is the international division that I run, yeah. um, whereby we are a network of 14 LGBTI I for intersex, um, chambers of commerce around the world, mm -hmm. promoting economic empowerment as well as inclusive economic growth for LGBTI people and business owners. And this really, again, comes from the idea that in many countries, there's significant challenges in the form of legal discrimination and stigma yeah. needing specific actions to include them into this idea of inclusive economic growth. Now, if a particular business uh, or the owner of the business identifies as LGBTI um, and perhaps faces discrimination. Um, is it helpful to be able to then publicly declare that you are a part of the LGBTI Chamber of Commerce? Well, <coughs> so within... I'm thinking in the context of a country like Belize. That's, yeah. that's why I'm very specific yeah. with it, yes. Sure, absolutely. No, it's a great question. And I think what we really strive for within this NGLCC global network is um, the ability for leaders on the ground to choose the way in which they present to the world. Okay. So it's not necessarily that when they face discrimination, they say, we're involved in an LGBTI chamber of yeah. commerce. They may or they may not. I think yeah. that's kind of the strength of this global network is that it provides the space for leaders mm -hmm. and their constituents on the ground to come up with their own strategies of engaging. What, I think what we really find throughout this network, the common thread, is that when you come together as a business community, LGBTI business community, we're quite, quite strong, we're quite creative, and we contribute significantly to our societies. I think this is best captured in the United States because we have data to show it, yes. but when we estimate um, the number of LGBT-owned businesses in the United States, we can see that they contribute well over $1.7 trillion wow. annually. And that's because, again, we, when we come together, we create, we're strong, and, um, and we're resilient. Are, is there a particular legal framework that enables um, this marginalized group to be able to operate differently or um, more com uh, competitively 
in the business market? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, again, it's this, when we look globally, it's this two ways of looking at that question. First, there are legal barriers that LGBTI people experience. Um, there's, for example? Well, for example, you know, there's laws that criminalize same-sex acts, right? And I think Belize had that law on the books we'll until that. 2016 <laughs> when it was when Caleb here. <laughs> it's no secret. <laughs> is, is that... Yeah, we've moved past that. <laughs> we've moved past yeah, that. Yeah, Belize has moved past that. Yeah, and, and it's a great example of how <laughs> activists on the ground um, have really come together to overturn these laws. So that's mm -hmm. just one example. But, but that's not the business. Well, we first have law. to look, I believe we first have to look at the laws that impact individuals as well as their ability to come together and collectivize, right? So if we look at, you know, I just gave an example of laws impacting LGB people, but also there are laws impacting the inclusion of trans people, which mm -hmm. is maybe for one example, um, a lack of ability to change um, one's gender on their birth certificate, yes. which mm -hmm. impacts their ability to travel, register, land, etc. just runs the gamut. So there are all sorts of laws that impact one's um, experience as an individual. There's also laws that impact um, an organization's ability to collectivize and come together. So that's another unit, that, or another unit of analysis that we have to consider. But when it comes to, um, after it comes to finding inclusion into economics, right, there are some policies um, that help, that help foster their resilience, their inclusion into the formal economy. And again, I alluded to this earlier, one example is supplier diversity in the United States. Mm -hmm. And that's part policy, but that's also part corporate side. They're saying, we have a specific interest of working with marginalized groups throughout mm -hmm. our supply chain so that we have a really diverse supply chain. And what we see um, when really examining the data is that this is good both for the suppliers as well as for the corporates. They see that supplier diversity lends to better mm -hmm. corporate um, bottom line profits. When, when, I, when I saw it, because I went on the website, it's, it's, the organization is out of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, in, it was interesting because I thought that business itself, well, in Belize I can speak, that business is more about product and quality as opposed to what feeds into it. So if you don't have a good product, I don't care what um, you are promoting it as, whether or not it, you're promoting it as yeah. green or um, yeah. as being... Um, indiscriminate. Yeah. If it's not a good product, then that's not it. So what specifically about economic empowerment as, as apart from support for people who are facing business problems um, does the organization do in the States before I reach the Belize? <laughs> sure. So your question was what about economic empowerment does yes. my organization? Yes. In terms of business, why, why, why the marriage between um, sexual orientation mm -hmm. And business, because I thought business was simply give me a good product. Or market it well. <laughs> and market it well. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, what we find is that LGBT business owners have stellar products, right? But unfortunately, there's this layer of discrimination mm -hmm. often that prohibits them from accessing credit to grow as a business or accessing job opportunities yeah. that otherwise non LGBT business owners might have. So we find that when all things being equal, LGBT business owners contribute significantly. But I think your question reaches to a larger one, which is why try to promote LGBTI economic empowerment, particularly in the global landscape? And I think this is really important because for, for a long time, when we talk about international LGBTI issues, we talk about human rights yeah. of LGBTI yeah. people. And that's great because that this that's will always... It's fundamental. It'll, this will always be a question of human rights yeah. um, and will continue to be. But I think this other side, this side of economic empowerment and inclusive economic growth is really important. Mm -hmm. And I think it adds to that human rights based discussion. But really, we have to, I think, begin to analyze global research and the experiences of LGBTI people and see that in context of legal discrimination and high stigma, there's a significant impact on socioeconomic status. and what. I'd like to say is there's a cycle of poverty that emerges. Mm -hmm. I mean, the World Bank has even looked at global data and see, saw that due to discrimination and stigma, LGBTI people are likely overrepresented among the bottom 40% of society. So there is a socioeconomic empowerment side that we really need to talk about and work with to promote. 
So let's uh, talk to Caleb now and talk about uh, this particular partnership and, and how it got started. Um, I tripped over myself and <laughs> a bomb showed up eventually. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, essentially, we were in a human rights observatory and I was looking for global data in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I sent out an email in, in one of the gl many global lists I'm in. And to my sh s horror, no, um, <laughs> <laughs> to my surprise, Phil sent some data references that I was looking for, and really that inspired the epiphany, if you will. And, and, and when I continued looking at the data, I realized that there's an economic component, and why not um, start a conversation, which took him to London, to Guyana, um, with our partners at the Parliamentarians for Global Action, and then I say, well, I might as well uh, bring into police to start this discussion. Yeah. So that's one. The second thing is, um, in 2014, the Ministry of Health estimated that uh, for its mode of transmission study that there were between 1,800 and 4,500 men who have sex with men. And so when we looked at that, plus the community data, the assessment reports that was created, you begin to realize the implication. Just as a scenario, the lower end of persons earning um, $720 a month for the entire year at $1,800 uh, leads to over $50 million being produced by just that 1,800 group of men who have sex with men. But when you move over to the 4,500, then when you calculate the income, just basic income on the higher end, um, to collectively they produce over $41 million um, in collective individual income. Now that has policy application for customer service, for socioeconomic benefits, things like pension, social security, insurance, and on and on and on. Now when you look at the women's side, you begin to understand that two-thirds of women don't participate in our labor force. But when I look at Petal assessment report, and I use just one part of it, you begin to see that the, the uh, lesbian women, bisexual and lesbian women, um, alone, using the number 5,000, generated over $60 million collectively. But nobody's collecting that data. The private sector isn't even having a, that discussion as to how do you use that income to increase your profit, create service. Um, how do you imp not only uh, improve profit, but then bring in employees who understand the population to then have the creative strategy necessary to reach a large market that we haven't even tapped, discussed, or even un bothered to understand. Mm -hmm. So that's really the context. Outside of that, for police, we have 43% poverty rate. We need to find new ways of generating employment and productivity. We're inefficient at using our human capital. So it's a conversation that is timely, and I believe, as a rebel browser, we can <laughs> lead. But in the absence of data, where do you start? Yeah. Absolutely. And so we, we're going to have a luncheon uh, between 11.30 and 1.30 at the BCI. Mm -hmm. it, the luncheon is free, and we're going to have that conversation uh, m more in depth about the life cycle, uh, the Im implication and discussion. So we start there. Outside of that, we know we carry the responsibility of doing data collection around poverty profile, um, more broadly looking at the legislative impact of socioeconomic exclusion, be it pension, Social Security, insurance, and the like. Yeah. Um, we know that we have to lobby and generate interest between the health system and the economic system. And there's no better time like the present to start a conversation about something that nobody else has considered before. But even in terms of, if, if I were to play devil's advocate and say that this is a bit premature, we, we've just, um, Belize has just matured itself um, Pass the legislative discrimination um, in the law after a hard fought case. Um, Belize is not at a position where we're looking at empowerment, we're just getting identity in terms of being able to be um, 
honest with ourselves to say this is part of who we are. Um, and so this is an added layer because part of what um, your organization does is to register um, LGBTI businesses. Mm -hmm. In Belize, people even saying that I'm LGBTI is huge. Yeah. So is it, there's no time like the present, but is it premature? Well, I would say when, we, when I started. No, data. When I started with the litigation um, six or seven years ago, it was also premature. <laughs> Look what happened. <laughs> Change and transformation. <laughs> and I would beg to defer on the use of the term premature because we live in an environment where young people are twice as likely to be unemployed. Um, women, two thirds of women, don't participate in the labor force. And so, premature, no. Necessary, yes. I say necessary because we're only one component of the economic growth required for our country. And in a country of 380,000 people where $3.3 billion is our G GDP, it's not in our interest to speak of premature um, inclusive growth or premature economic growth. It's in our interest to be efficient in how we address various groups as part of the human capital concern. So no. It's not premature. It's very timely. What, 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 what would be? I know we're just starting the conversation, yeah. and it's not premature. But what are some of the challenges for economic empowerment that the LGBTI community are facing in Belize currently? Well, he alluded to the idea of a trans person walking into a bank to try and get credit. Big turn off by the gender expression. Big turn off by the gender identity, and so. It's the, there's this thing called covert or overt bias or conscious or unconscious um, bias. And that plays into, well, the lender forgetting for a moment that it's about getting a customer. Yeah. So, so you have that bias playing into the, the credit. But this well, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna just jump in there because I think it is, it is a very, very crucial point. And I think it is then opening up the eyes uh, of Belizeans to the plight of the specific transgender group, which no. we don't talk about. Absolutely. I mean, we have just come to uh, accept, or I, I, don't, I wouldn't say accept, um, I think the sexual orientation issue is one that is a bit more normalized. But transgender conversations in this country <laughs> is almost non-existent, minus the cases of violence that we've seen uh, with persons who choose to identify as a different sex. So I, I want to ask, how do you enter into that conversation at this point in time when it's been kind of a, a closed door that nobody wants to open? In very simple terms, we're citizens. We all have the same aspirations. And it's about building a win-win relationship between the various parties concerned with one thing, benefit. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody will run through the door, destroy a process, when they know there's a benefit to be gained by investing in that person called citizen, that person who makes part of a collective human capital investment required yeah. that is of interest to all, not some. Now granted, you will have your minority group who will be loud and resistant and so on. But it doesn't change a fundamental fact. Either you empower an individual to be economically self-reliant and independent of a system which already does not have a strong safety net, or you deal with the consequence of not having that individual being able to contribute to your community. And mm -hmm. um, I think uh, another way to answer your question is to really pull from global and regional experiences because mm -hmm. there's so many great examples out there mm -hmm. of LGBTI people coming together, combating labor market discrimination, yeah. working with corporates on better workplace policies. So many great examples. I think what's been fantastic with this NGLCC global network has been um, working with, again, 14 LGBTI chambers of commerce around the world to pull in these examples and see where they can work elsewhere. Yeah. So for example, we have many partners throughout Central South America, as well as the Caribbean, um, even India. And India is a great example, I think, that speaks to your question of trans mm -hmm. inclusion because 
in India, actually, there's a law which prohibits um, uh, non-procreative sexual acts, and that's used against LGBT people. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's a Supreme Court ruling saying we're upholding the rights of trans and third gender people, mm -hmm. awesome. which is fascinating because globally, usually, it's LGB, rights for LGB people and yeah. then for trans people. But here, it's actually trans people. And hopefully, down the line, it'll be LGB people. And I think there's a lot of stories to learn from mm. um, when it comes to answering how we can cultivate transclusion. So share with us your experience in moving into a new country uh, similar to Belize. and, and how you get the conversation started. I'm sure the chamber who have conversations <laughs> with many different representatives didn't think they'd be having a conversation about whether or not you want to identify as a LGBTI business. Tell us how you start, what's your starting point? Oh yeah, always doing your homework. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's just so much great, rich, qualitative data yeah. out there that Unibam, Pedal, other organizations in Belize has already collected, and, yeah. and we really just need to do our homework. And, and Caleb has kindly sent me all of those reports. Yeah. Um, and then it comes down to scoping and seeing, you know, seeing the leaders who are in Belize or in any other country, what are they doing? What is their read mm -hmm. on the situation? Do they see a pathway of economic empowerment? And then it's, um, and then it's working with the, you know, the business community at large, seeing if there's entry points there yeah. for an LGBTI component. Yeah. So again, it really comes down to doing your homework, scoping, and, um, and working with leaders. Our network yeah. revolves around strong leaders on the ground. So in, to be very clear, it's not just about identifying a business as being led by an LGBTI person. It's also about tapping into opportunities where you can use this specific market as well. Is that what you do? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so part of part of our model revolves around you know finding those business opportunities, mm -hmm. often through corporations, multinational corporations, who again have shown an interest already in a number of countries that yeah. they want to work with LGBTI-owned businesses as well as individuals um, throughout their operations. So we, mm -hmm. it's just about identifying those opportunities. He, what he's telling you is that they just started a conversation in Jamaica. Mm. Imagine that. If they can start a conversation in Jamaica, nothing is impossible in Belize. <laughs> so, so, so that to me is interesting. Yeah. They, uh, and, and so he talks about like work and homework, but it's also about finding those one or two champi business champions, yeah. people who have a clear vision of where to take a discussion. And, and, and so even after he leaves this week, my job is to, to either uh, reach out to those business people to see if they can provide strategy or they can provide references. Yeah. And my job is just to follow up to c gauge person's interest and then hook them up or they hook themselves up and uh, we start <laughs> a conversation. Normally it's very organic in any process for creating something that you have no idea yeah. where it will go, as in Unibam, for yeah. example. But how does one assess the economic cost of discrimination. I mean, please jump in and I'll. <laughs> 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 because he really wants to start it off. I think we both love answering this question. <laughs> for us, what we were looking at, uh, for example, from the legal side, is how many pieces of legislation excludes LGBT individuals from benefits that that everybody else takes for granted. Mm -hmm. So that's one. The second part of that is examining the perception of policymakers and persons in position of authority to see how they view our economic contribution. Mm -hmm. And then the third part of that is really examining our community to see if, if they feel economically excluded. Now, one of the things I learned with our work is, is there's a, so a psychosocial component that is always there. Worry about violence, outing family, uh, or family outing them. But one of the things we learn, especially from our human rights observatory, is this. We have one particular case where a lesbian woman was um, studying to, for her primary ed degree, and her father decides that he would not pay for a particular loan to, get, to allow her to finish. That's a cause. Because then you can calculate specifically how much she would earn mm -hmm. as a teacher and, and what happened over a period of 10 years 
and then you can calculate collectively what that one individual will lose because they're they're forced to go to a job, lesser paying job um, that they didn't want. So that's one example. Another example was uh, uh, for a trans community is this. Um, we know from our Latin American research that quite a few of them, over 60% of them, are forced to, to, to revert to sex work to survive. For beliefs, the question is, well, if you lose your ability to educate yourself, literally at the primary level, and nobody will hire you, what is the productive loss of that individual over mm. a period of 10 years? Um, who could have possibly earned $720 a month, or who could have a minimum, uh, or $8,620 a year? What is the, the productive loss over a period of 10 years? That's quite a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. So we start there. And then when you look within the context of things like customer service, application of taxes, um, the, the exclusion of Social Security benefits towards them because, well, they don't contribute, then the, the bill piles up. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you're, sorry, you yeah, I mean, just on top of all that, I think, you know, these costing exercises to measure the impact of discrimination mm -hmm. have, have a rich history. Um, one great example is the cost of violence against women, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the cost of LGBT exclusion is just a natural progression from that. And, and it's something that, you know, that it's work that I've led at the World Bank with Dr. Lee Badgett. And what we did was use India as a case study. And we saw that um, in areas of you know, stigma and legal discrimination, yeah. there's micro level impacts can, which can be added up and aggregated to yeah. this larger GDP impact. And actually, when you crunch those numbers in India, you can see that up to $30.8 billion is lost due to exclusion in the health, education, and employment sectors. So that's the one side, that's the cost. And then there's even the flip side, which is the economic benefit of LGBT, LGBTI mm -hmm. inclusion, which is another pathway we hope to advance. Hmm. Yeah, the, the, the angle that your organization comes from is more from the business yeah. um angle. Um, but it, the conversation is more in, in this realm about general economic empowerment. Yeah. And the from the businessman standpoint, it's a little bit more narrow because there are certain safeguards, whether or not um, it is more um, pronounced or less pronounced is a matter for debate. But when you're dealing with specifically empowering the LGBTI community to be able to um, have businesses, successful businesses, without having to deal with the disbenefits of their sexual orientation, it's a very narrow area. For example, the example that we gave of the bank, even though the person who's the loan officer might look at me or you and say, you know what, um, I just don't like the mannerisms, and so I'm going to probably put this file somewhere else. His supervisor, because the bank is specifically worried only about profits, don't care if it's a whoever, a black person, a gay person, don't care. What they're worried about is will this business um, make money and will you be able to pay back the loan? So their considerations, which are somehow above the details. That's the first aspect of it. Now, in Belize, aren't there certain absences in terms of the strength of conducting the business on a whole? And so the Chamber of Commerce, in terms of focusing specifically on this issue, they're not even there yet. Let me throw something <laughs> at you. A real, real moment. Um, when we had a particular, I, I won't say what bank, Mm -hmm. We applied to open an account for a particular bank, and they, and they dr dragged their feet, dragged their feet for like two weeks, only for me to learn that they weren't going to open, they had no intention of opening our bank account. Wow. Now, if they didn't open our bank account, it means my organization would have been done for. Did they say why? No. But uh, with a person like me, a rebel rouser, uh, you don't tell me no without saying why. You have that right. So I took the issue to top management. I took the issue globally. I won't say where. <laughs> and, um, see, see. <laughs> and as a result, they were kind enough to reconsider their position. That, to me, is a good example of how complicity by indifference 
omission and action can literally undermine a total effort, a, a, a social effort, much less an economic one. Yeah. So for Belize, is that impossible? Is that impossible? The difference between me, an old gay man running a gay organization, and a person who's afraid to, to challenge the system, is that I will not tolerate anything less than inclusion in when it comes to advancing economic independence. Mm. There's a challenge though, Caleb, which is specifically ensuring that the reason why your application was turned down is because of your sexual orientation. And that might be an assumption. And, and, I, and I, wanna, I, I appreciate that you said that, because I think that's where we can tap into the differences between the development of, of let's say, the United States versus Belize in, in laws. Uh, yeah. You know, you can very easily take a case to court if you feel you've been discriminated right. against whether you've been told so or not right. because of whatever identity you have. In Belize, we don't see that. It's more uh, kind of just delaying, frustrating the process. And you may very well, you may even hear somebody say, I don't want to deal with him because he's whatever. But you, you have very little recourse from there. Well, let me point out to you the reason why. And it was played out for six years. I had to take my licks. And I had to change the way I move, the way I uh, meet people, in order to live through my litigation process. Mm -hmm. Not everybody have a thick rhinoceros hide like mine to deal with crap. Yeah. And so, but fundamentally, I have a person that, that I could call Ma. Mm -hmm. I have a lady called Sister. And collectively, they Sports. held up my backbone while I grounded myself in stubbornness and fought back to stand yeah. for, or I guess at least get my um, court decision. But of course, going to court doesn't necessarily mean you, you act automatically get a decision, because then you have to fight for the decision. <laughs> and it doesn't automatically change the mindsets of people, and especially in a society where, as I said before, they may not outrightly discriminate, but they may frustrate because Absolutely. they can. Absolutely. And unfortunately, in our human rights observatory, we see time and time again, our people ball about, they don't want no trouble. Well, I get frustrated about that because how much time somebody would lick you up and down, bruise you up and down, before you realize yeah. you will constantly have trouble if you don't hold the perpetrator of that incident accountable. You don't get your freedoms by begging for it. You demand it with a stick. In my case, I had a legal stick. <laughs> so w for me, I don't care how frustrated they, they think they could be. You will answer and provide me a good answer that is acceptable to my dignity. Not less, the same. Because I'm not asking for different treatment. I'm asking what th that you do your job and mm -hmm. get something done, period. Okay. This, the, the partnership between um, uh, your organization and um, Unibam now with the luncheon this afternoon, what is, where, where, where are we going? Is it, is it that we're going to have a chapter in Belize? Is it that we're going to have a subsection of the Belize Chamber of Commerce specifically geared towards dealing with this issue? Where do we go institutionally? We're from here. From here. Yeah, sure. And, and again, I think we're, we're both scoping out um, how to work with each other. So there's yeah. no clear, direct way um, yeah. that, this, that this week will end. I yeah. think, again, it's really important for my organization and NGLCC Global to really you know, find the leaders um, in each country and figure out the landscape, yeah. what it is. I think what we really come together on and what we've had numerous discussions about is just this economic empowerment side yeah. of LGBTI inclusion, as well as the inclusive economic growth side. So insofar as we are having conversations and meetings and presentations yeah. along that, along, through that lens, um, I think that's really a longer conversation we'll have to have in terms of what can be created. And who are you meeting with this week, other than the Chamber? Um, we have a meeting with the Inter-American Development Bank. Mm -hmm. um, we have a meeting with a couple of business people separate from the luncheon. Um, we have a meeting with the BTB. Um, uh, we're connected to BTIA already to have 
to try and have this conversation. Um, and then there's one more group I just can't remember. My head is spinning. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the, 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 right, the Ministry of Health, <laughs> okay. um, because this has an application yeah. around the Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah. And um, as you know, um, fighting is what I do for transformation and better. And that's part of our process, always. Okay. Right. Well, best of luck this week, and do keep us updated. No problem. Thank you for being here. We're going to go ahead and take a break, and when we come back, we'll get all the details about the Valentine Mega Party Concert coming up this weekend. So stay tuned. <laughs>